Shalom brethren, we come to another Bible teaching where hopefully you can apply your mind, body, soul and strength to obeying God and getting his promise. We are instructed in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, Matthew 22 verse 37, Luke chapter 10 verse 27 and Mark chapter 12 verse 30 from which I'll quote And thou shalt love Yahweh thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment spoken by, as spoken by Yeshua, meaning your whole being. Now we can learn and apply those four things partially or collectively to non-godly things or false gods. Remember the verse it says all or each. There is an abundance of motivation and positive thinking speakers out, out in the world, whether speaking biblical things or non-biblical, or speaking from the Bible or not. However, positive thinking does not necessarily change reality. In the Bible and Yahweh God's context, you can have all the faith you want in a lie and it shall still be a lie. You can be totally convinced you are saved, but if you do not meet the if criteria spoken of numerous times in the Bible, you, be, you believe a lie. The truth can only offend those who live or believe a lie, hence there be gnashing of teeth on some of the just, sums of Judgment Day when they believe they're a lie. There are many Bible verses given warnings, Jeremiah chapter 5, 31, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 to verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, from which I'll quote, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. When he did this with Eve, came to Eve as if he had information for her in the garden. John chapter 8, verse 32. Only the truth can set you free of Satan's deceits and lies. Remember Ephesians chapter 6 says, Put on the whole armour of God, which is the word of God. Psalms 119 verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. Yes, and the truth will set you free. In two former presentations, titled, Is Keeping the Passover Denying Yeshua, or vice versa, and the second one is titled The Power of Your Revelation and Grace. I covered the Bible reasons for keeping the Passover from coming out of Egypt to, to our future, in other words, for all eternity. Simply, God instructed in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. I also shared some thoughts of two Christians in part two that was, who um, in, the, in the second study, the study that is, um, of two Christians who had made discoveries in their Bible studies and changed their ways from believing traditions of men as taught by their denominations to coming closer to obeying the true teachings of the Bible, i.e. about grace. Today I want to share some Christian theology history of which most Christians are unaware and thus are led by, spirit, are, are led by spiritually blinded or ignorant pastors into keeping things that are an abomination to Yahweh God of the Bible. Frankly, for many reasons, they do not cultivate their spiritual mind by applying strength to learning the Bible and various denominations' history. No, it's too hard for them and too time-consuming and so forth. So that, they, so that their body can serve God in truth and their soul return to God on Judgment Day. Remember, in other words, they're not like the Bereans who study to make themselves, a, sorry, the Bereans who took, take, things, take things to the Bible and see if what their denominations actually teach them is actually true. So one is as Matthew seven twenty one to 23, I shall quote. I never knew you, depart from me, 
you that were iniquity. So those are people who came and said, Lord, Lord, let me in, basically into heaven. And Jesus said, I never knew you. And I always say, when he says never, he means not even when they were baptized or did all the good deeds they thought were good. They were actually doing iniquity. Next one is a warning, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Um, have little positive effect on them. So Hosea, so one is as in Matthew 7, 21, 23, and my point, and Hosea has little effect on such people. They're so entrenched in keeping to their denominations' teachings. Hosea 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, which is the state of most Bible readers today. Because they are told the laws and of God, I mean, there to the cross. So, some history taken from Faith of Our Fathers by Cardinal Gibbons on page 89, edition of 1917. Read Glean the following illuminating information as to Rome's attitudes towards the Holy Scriptures. Quote A rule of faith or a competent guide to heaven must be able to instruct all the truths necessary for salvation. Now, the scriptures alone do not contain all the truths which a Christian is bound to believe, nor do they explicitly enjoin all the duties which he is obliged to practice. Remember, this is Catholic's writing. Not to mention other examples, is not, is not every Christian obliged to sanctify Sunday and to abstain on that day from unnecessary servile work? Is it not the observance of this law among the most promising of our sacred duties? Remember, our sacred duties, not the Bibles. But you may read, again, quoting from, there, quoting from them, but you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelations and you will not find a single line authorising the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we, the Catholic Church, never Sanctified. And remember the Protestant churches that most people attend today, Pentecostal, Baptists, all of them, all came out of the Reformation, um, departing from this Catholic Church, by which time they had already taken on this theology of the Catholic Church. Continuing. William James, in his Sermon on the Sac Sacrament and Sabbath, page 122-23, says, When the practice of keeping Saturday Sabbaths which had become so general at the close of this century, that's the 4th century, was evidently gained, gaining ground in the Eastern Church. A decree was passed in the Council of Laodicea, that's 364 years after Christ had died, that members of the Church should not rest from work on the Sabbath like the Jews. In other words, they wanted to separate things of the Jews um, from things from Christianity. Anyway, continuing. It is a remarkable fact that the first instance upon record which the Bishop of Rome attempted to rule a Christian church was by an edict in behalf of Sunday, or on behalf of Sunday. It had been the custom of all the churches to celebrate the Passover, but, the, but this difference, so but, but with this difference, that while the Eastern churches observed it upon the 14th day of the first month, as the Bible states, Exodus chapter 12, no matter what day of the week this might be, this might have fallen on, the Western churches kept it upon the Sunday following that day, or rather upon the Sunday following Good Friday, what they call Good Friday, assuming he died on a, on a Friday, they say, but he didn't, he died on a Thursday, on a Wednesday evening. Victor, Bishop of Rome, in the year 196, taken from Bauer's History of the Popes, Volume 1, page 18 and 19, Roses near the page, and also from Roses um, near the page 188 to 190, and down in his History of Rome, Rome, Romanism, Book 1, Chapter 2, um, Section 9, took upon him to impose the Roman custom upon all the churches, that is, to compel them to observe the Passover upon the Sunday. 
This bold attempt, says Bauer, we may call the first essay of papal usurpation. In other words, usurping the Pope's authority over the ways of God. Taken from History of the Popes, Volume 1, page 18. Now, Dowling terms it the earliest instance of Romish assumption. Again, History of Rome, Romanism, headings on page 32. The churches of Asia Minor informed the victor that they could not comply with this lordly mandate. Then, says Boa, quote for the book, upon the receipt of this letter, victor, giving the, rein, giving the reins to an ungovernable passion, published bitter invectives against all the churches of Asia, declared them, to, declared them cut off from his communion, sent letters of excommunication to their respective bishops, and at the same time, in order to have them cut off from the communion of the whole church, wrote to the other bishops, exhorting them to follow his example and forbear communication, communicating with their re refractory brethren of Asia. Again, taken from History of the Popes, Volumes 1, page 18. The victory was not obtained for Sunday in the struggle, as Heslin testifies. Quote, Till the great council of Nicaea, that's 321 days after Christ's uh, death, backed by the authority of as great an emperor of Constantine, settled it better than before. None but other scattered schismatics sch sch now and then appearing dorsk oppose the resolution of that famous synod. Taken from History of the Sabbath, part two, chapter two, sections four and five. In other words, once they got the emperor's consent and authority, Emperor Constantine, it basically became law. Continuing, Constantine, by his powerful influence, the Council of Nicaea was induced to decide this question in favor of a Roman bishop. That, remember they're called the Church of Rome, Roman Catholic, or Roman Catholic Church of Rome, because they were part of the um, Roman <coughs> system. So continue. That is to fix the Passover upon Sunday, urge the following strong reasons for the measure. Continue. Let us then have, have nothing in common with the most hostile rabble of the Jews. Again, all these are quotes from studying history of the Catholic Church, and Christian denominations. Continue from one of the quotes. The retention of the old pagan name of Deis Solis, or Sunday, for the weekly Christian festival is in great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment, with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the vulnerable Vulnerable day of the sun. So, in other words, he uplifted the day of the sun, Sunday. His decree regulating its observance has been justly called a new era in the history of the Lord's Day. It was his mode of harmonizing, his mode being his method, of harmonizing the discordant religions of the empire under the common institution. So in other words, the Eastern Church and Western Church had different ways of doing things. The Eastern Church followed the Bible ways, and the Western Church followed the rules of Rome, and Constantine basically outlawed the Eastern ways and made everyone follow one way. The first day of the week was proclaimed as a day of rest and worship, and its observance soon became general throughout the empire. In 321 AD, Constantine forbade, you know, was, um, you know what, not for baby, outlawed, the courts to be held on Sunday, except for the purpose of giving freedom to slaves, and on that day, soldiers were commanded to omit their daily military exercises. But the public games were, con were continued on Sunday, tending to make it more of a holiday than a holy day. Again, you can see the reference, Herbert's story of the Christian Church, page 77. As a protest against Jewish observance of the seventh day, the practice of fasting on Saturday arose in the West, but never in the East. Taken from um, later, the Roman Catholic 
fast day was changed to Friday. In other words, they tried to make people not like the Sabbath day by making it a day of fasting and sadness and so on and so forth, and making Sunday a joyous day of um, you can't work, you don't have to work, and you, know, you can do your, your games and all that kind of stuff. Originally, labour did not cease on the first day of the week, but seems to have been gradually discontinued as circumstances permitted. At what time cease ceasing citation from it became general, if it became so before the time of Constantine, when it was enjoined by law, except in agricultural districts, where sowing and reaping and tending the vine were allowed. It is impossible to assert. In other words, this change came over a period, period of, of time. Um, although the law, just like, in, just like most, most laws, um, no, it, no, there was a, there's a practice, Eastern and Western, and then the law made everyone under one umbrella. Anyway, among the festivals considered simply as voluntary memorials of the, re, of the Redeemer, Sunday had very little permanence, for it is well stated by Helen. Take which you will, in other words, people had a choice at first. Take which you will, either the fathers or the moderns, and we shall find no Lord's Day instituted by any apostol apostolic mandate, no Sabbath set on foot by them upon the first day of the week. Here's your Sabbath. In other words, this is not something that was done by the apostles or the early church the first 400 years after Christ's death, or 300 or so years after Christ's death. A Catholic claims the follows. It was the Roman Catholic Church that changed the Sabbath from Sunday, the seventh day of the week. Sorry, from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day. And at the Council of Lycia, we anathemized, you know, was, um, what would I say? Anyway, look at that. But basically made, made them of a bad, of a bad reputation. We anathemize those who kept the Sabbath and urge all persons to labor on the seventh day, you know, make it a day of work and chores and whatever, of the week, on a penalty of anathema, anathema. You know, we've been distanced from the church, cut off from the church and so forth. Father and right Catholic priest deceased Kansas City, Missouri from a lecturer at Harlem, um, Iowa, published in the Harlem Weekly Paper. So that's from his research of the Catholic um, material. So that is a little history on how and when the Christian church departed from the Bible teachings of keeping the things practiced by order of God in the Old Testament, practiced and taught by Yeshua, most you call Jesus in the New Testament, and also practiced and taught by the apostles in the early churches in Bible times. Simply, the pagan church of Rome wanted people to follow false god hope the false god host of heaven worship and not things of God. They call things of, which they call things of the Jews, to whom God gave his oracles to pass on to the New Testament believers. Um, people wanted to seek him, like, like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So if you read Acts chapter 7 verse 38, it says, This is he that was in the church. Now the New Testament, the English word is church, um, but it's actually taken from the word congregation, we mean the word, word congregation. And if, but you, you can see from the actual context of the sentence anyway. For this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. So taking you back to the time when he came out of Egypt. In the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So that sentence makes it clear. The church, the congregation, is, it was a group that came out of Egypt and received the, the words of God at Mount Sinai. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 also says, For unto us, New Testament people, was the gospel preached as well as unto them. In other words, it's the same things that what they got, we should be pressing. There's no two, two gospels. There's, there is only the gospel, not a gospel. It's only one true gospel. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 2 says, God speaking, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feast of of the Lord or Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, holy times of meeting, gathering. Even these are my feasts. So, as where the Catholic Church tried to make them things of the Jews, God made it clear they're things of His, not of Jews. 
now, in case people say Christians are taught, oh, but that's for Israel. If you study who Israel are, Israel are anyone who God actually called them my people. The group that came out of Egypt, and that group that came out of Egypt was the descendants of Jacob and his 70 family members and all the servants and householders they took in. If you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, I think it is, they took 12 households in. So all, so all the descendants, all the Gentiles that made up part of Jacob's family households, those are Israel. They're not some special Hebrew people. There's a Hebrew and they're Israelites. They're two different terms that you, you need to learn. If you go on the... Um, forward to Yahweh.com website. There's a study titled, Who are the Real Jews? You can um, educate yourself on that. Anyway, continuing. God warned Israel about following idolatry in the Old Testament and in the New Testament does likewise. So Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 3, God says, And have gone and served other gods and worshipped them, even the sun or moon, or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. And then you also see the same idolatry expressing in 1 Corinthians verse 10. So that was the practice of paganism, worshipping the sun, the moon, the stars, like Jupiter and Mercury, as you need in the book of Acts. Um, the thought Paul and Barnabas were from gods of Jupiter and Mercury. And that is just what the Catholic Church did, is it brought in um, sun worship to Christianity via Constantine's enforcement. Okay, so the New Testament one is about idolatry. Reading from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, this is Paul speaking, I would not that they should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat of the same spiritual meat. See? Same oracles of God. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Christ didn't start in the New Testament, he was there from the foundation of the earth. As first John chapter I think first John says, In the beginning there was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and then verse fourteen, and that word was manifested into the flesh. Um, human beings so we can see a, a physical body in Monsieur. But that, but Yeshua didn't start, you know, at his birth in the New Testament, he's there from the old. Continue First 1 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 10, verse 5. But with, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were for our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, i.e. going after false gods because they have good worship songs in their, in their congregations. Verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Fornication was the false god worship of hosts of heaven. It has nothing to do with men and women having sex outside of marriage. But you can see the context of what Paul is talking about. If you go back and read the Old Testament version of that incident, you see they were worshipping false gods, idolatry, fornication. As some of them committed and fell in one day. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for our examples, and they are written for our admonition, unto whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh, he standeth, taketh heed, lest he fall. In other words, you think you're following the right theology, be careful. Verse 13. They, they have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge you what I say. The cup of the blessings which we bless, 
Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which I break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. Remember, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifices to idols is anything? But I say, listen clear carefully, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. So your congregation, um, the days they worship and all that kind of stuff, may be a sacrifice to devils. may have good music and good motivation speaking, but is a sacrifice to devils. Verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of Yahweh and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Now, if you can't mix and match, can't go here for the music and go for one for another one for the commandments of God. You've got to go to one place that has the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because a little leaven can corrupt you. So apart from a lack of Christian history, history knowledge, let us look at some of the ways even the Bible reading Christians have been deceived into following Satan's deceits. I said one above is to worship um, following the ways of Constantine rather than the ways of the Bible. Number one, Peter says... Peter says one in 2 Peter chapter 3.16. It reads, this is Peter talking about understanding Paul's writings. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. So basically what Peter's saying that the people who are unlearned misunderstand Paul's writings and also other scriptures. Now when he used that word, and he calls them the wicked, um, no, the wicked people don't follow God's commandments. We can see that all the places in the Bible. Now, when Peter used that word, the only thing to be learned in was the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. So he's saying if you're unlearned in the Old Testament, you misunderstand Paul's writings and think he's giving people a new way to do things different to what God says. Christians are deceived into focusing on the New Testament and thinking the things of the Old Testament are not to be followed. Apart from the good things that they like, the promises of God, you be the head and not the tail, and paying tithes to the pastors, that's the one the pastors like. Second, when Paul said in 2 Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, there was no New Testament. But yet Christians have told you that they talk, it's talking about the New Testament as well, Paul's writings. No, it is not talking about Paul's writings. They say, oh, it's all inspired by God and so forth. Not necessarily. That is just a story of the events that happened. So when you read Corinthians 5, for example, 1 Corinthians 5 about um, what the Gentiles did in Corinthians church, that is not inspired by God. Paul is just giving an account, or, or the Bible is giving an account of what went on. So when Paul said all scripture... He meant the Old Testament. And that is there to reprove people of their errors, in other words, transgressing God's laws, and so forth. And for instruction in righteousness. I say, yet Christians are taught to give his writings prominence over the Old, where God spoke and gave his instructions. You can always find them quoting Paul to justify their errors rather than quoting God. And, and I say, it's not because Paul is saying anything against what the scripture says, they're just misunderstanding Paul's writings, which we'll see later on. They create doctrines contrary to God's by misunderstanding his explanations. Even when he makes it clear in other verses, they are blinded and not see, keeping all the commandments of God given by Moses is essential for salvation. Paul, 2 Timothy 3, 3.15, And that from a child... Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ. 
So it says, you learn the Old Testament and it will lead you to faith in Christ. Galatians 2.17 But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Remember sin? First John is transgression of the law. Is therefore Christ the minister, the teacher, the promoter of sin? God forbid. Absolutely not, Paul says. Now this is the clear one. 1 Corinthians 7.19 Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. That includes everything that God says, which includes Leviticus chapters 23's holy days. Thirdly, being unlearned in the Old Testament and being deceived as to modern day paraphrases, Bible versions as a New Testament, New International Version, etc. They do not notice word changes or wrong, or wrong commentaries. For example, they think the first day of the week is Sunday. And that Messiah rose on a Sunday. Hence their authority to worship on a Sunday. There's no such authority. We'll see. Genesis chapters 1 verses 5, 8 and 13 tells us that God's days start at the evening, the sunset. Different to man's days, which starts at midnight. The evening and the morning was the first day, the evening and the morning was the second day and so forth. The, our words, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, starts at midnight. Thus, the first day, in biblical terms, is our Saturday evening. Say, so, let's say sunset at 6 p.m. So it's from Saturday, 6 p.m. So, sorry, it's our Saturday evening. So, because um, the seventh day finishes at sunset Friday evening to sunset Saturday evening. So, let's say sunset at 6 p.m. So one minute past 6 p.m. our Saturday is actually the biblical first day of the week. And that first day goes on to sunset on a Sunday. Whereas the word Sunday doesn't start till one minute past our Saturday midnight. Okay, So he, Yeshua, rose Saturday evening, not Sunday morning, when Mary went to the tomb and saw he had already gone. But that's what, what they'll, they'll tell you. I'll cover this further down below, but clear, basically Mark chapter 16 verse 9 says, When Yeshua was risen early the first day of the week. So if sunset is at 6 p.m., early will be 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m., still our Saturday night. It hasn't yet reached Saturday midnight to be changed to Sunday. Secondly, they think Sabbath only refers to the weekly Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. Not knowing that all of God's holy days, or Leviticus 23, are called Sabbaths. Hence, are deceived into thinking Mark chapter 15, verse 42, which says, And now when the evening, see, as I said, the day's finishing, was come, because it was the preparation day, so the day's changing now, that is the day before the Sabbath. They think it's referring to um, Good Friday, hence we just read about the, good, the Catholic Church made up Good Friday. And that he died on Good Friday. But he didn't. He died on a Wednesday. And so the Sabbath they're talking about is the unleavened, the unleavened bread Sabbath. Reading Leviticus chapter 23, I think around about verse 5 or 6 or thereabouts. You see, he talks about the first day of unleavened bread. And that's the Sabbath they wanted to rush, get him to the tomb beforehand. Okay? And if you take the only sign that he says would be of him, um, three, yes, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, that's how you get from Wednesday sunset to Saturday sunset. You have Thursday, you have, um, Thursday Friday, and you rose on Saturday. Anyway, there's your three days and three nights in short. You'll never get that from Friday 6 p.m. to Sunday 6 a.m. when they claim Mary Magdalene went and saw it wasn't there. The fourth, uh, where am I up to? Oh, yes. The third point, um, word changing. They are deceived into thinking that Yeshua's healing equates to man's working and thus believe he was breaking the Sabbath when he healed on the Sabbath day. He was not healed on the Sabbath day. Sorry, he was not working. It's not work. They don't know the difference between what is work and what is not work. Fourthly, they think that thinking that Gentiles are non-Israelites rather than Israelites living in a Gentile country or foreign nation. Gentiles is really another word for nations. So what it is, which we see later on below, is when Israel were scattered, when they forsook God's laws, he scattered them by the Syrians, 
and they ended up in foreign nations and they became Gentiles because they're now living out of Jerusalem and so forth. So when, if you look on the website uh, forward to Yahweh dot com or the YouTube channel forward to and then the second word Yahweh, look up the Apostles doctrines and it goes through all the teachings of the Apostles. You see that where Paul went when he said he's going to onto the Gentiles, he actually went on to Jewish people in his synagogues. He didn't go to natural Gentiles. Okay, point number four. Our word changes, or the word changes, sorry, are as changing the Passover meal to the Lord's Supper or Easter. So again, all these word changes confuse, makes people who are ignorant of what the Bible actually says, uh, makes people think of something different to what the Bible is actually meaning. But the biggest ignorance is thinking the New Testament is all about, is all of a sudden about them. Christians, rather than the scattered ten tribes of Israel who were divorced by God, as I said, read 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 18 to 20, and I think even up to, um, yeah, up to the end of the chapter. That says, Therefore the Lord Yahweh was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So that's when they got scattered. And later, Judah also did a little bit of sinning, not as much as Israel, and they got scattered, sent into Babylon. Um, if you look, read the prophecies of Jeremiah, um, he says it, and then the 70 years, they're in with Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 and 9 and 10, you read it there. So when Jeremiah 31, 31 talks about a new covenant, you notice it was not with Judah, it was with the ten tribes of Israel. You also see this mentioned, I think, Hebrews chapters 8 and 10. Anyway, Continue. Had these had people had they been learned in the Old Testament, they would know God's sentiments about Israel. He doesn't cast them away and make Christians or choose another group as they think. The descendants of Abraham. He doesn't cast away the descendants of Abraham. In other words, Isaiah chapter forty nine verse sixteen tells how God, although Israel may sin, they still his firstborn child. As it says, in Exodus chapters three, I think. When God told Moses, go and tell Pharaoh that Israel is his son. Anyway, Isaiah chapter 49 verse 16. Behold, I have graven thee, talking about Israel, upon the palms of my hands. Thy wars are continually before me. And then Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, absolutely not. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Okay, so let's go on to a bit more on this first day of the week, um, which the Catholics say is Sunday, and you'll see it is not. The New Testament refers to the first day of the week about seven times. Each is explained in a topic titled Celebrating the First Day of the Week in a free book, Have I Got It Right God, titled, and there's a link to that appended. But some of them is when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Some of them is different things, but mainly it, most you'll see it generally refers to Saturday evening, even when Paul was doing his speech before he went travelling the next day. But I'm going to focus on just on the resurrection section use of the word first of the week, um, and I'm going to use in regards to its use for Messiah's resurrection. I shall read from my comments on an article that I wrote on Mark 16, where one account of the resurrection time is given. So, reading from Mark chapter 16, verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, now I said there's a difference between the weekly Sabbath and the annual Sabbath. So this Sabbath is talking about the weekly Sabbath, the end of the Saturday evening. Um, but the one on which he died was an annual Sabbath, or of unleavened bread. And that's the ignorance of Christians. They don't know it's two different Sabbaths. Anyway. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Verse 2. And very early in the morning, the first of the week, um, they came onto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Now, see, I've crossed out the word day because the word day you see in italics in King James's version is to show it's been inserted by the people. The actual wording of the original just says the first of the week. 
Anyway, they came to the at the rising of the sun. So now they come one day, the sun was rising when it's daylight for them to see. They couldn't come whilst it's dark on Saturday night or early hours of Sunday morning. Verse 6. Now when, yeah, so they, so, but the Catholic Church or Christians would teach you that use that time of when they came as when he was risen. No, he had already gone. And it says very clearly in verse 9. When Yeshua was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So here is the explanation. So in verse 2, here we have a definite time by which Yeshua was already risen. Risen, uh, the rising of the sun. Say 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. when the sun, sun is coming up. Not when he rose. Remember the first day starts at sunset. After the seventh day, our Saturday evening, say 6 p.m. And as, as I said, Genesis chapters 1, verses 5, 8, and 13, the evening and the morning, and the, uh, make the day. In verse 9, we have a better indication of when he rose. Early, the first. Early is a few hours into the day. We started, to say, at 6 p.m., the sunset ending of the seventh day. Now, John chapters 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. So that's why, now see, they couldn't come before. Upon a sepulchre and see if the stone taken away from a sepulchre. Yeah? So that's not when he was being risen. The stone's already moved away. He had already gone. So he therefore rose Saturday evening, not Sunday morning. Make sure you do not think verse 2, early in the morning... When Mary went there is the same time as verse 9, early the first day. Yeah? So day has different parts. So early the first day is not the same as early in the morning. Just like we must say early in the evening, in the evening is not the same as early in the day. Yes, yeah? so different times. A day has four parts of which morning is one part. Mark chapter 13 verse 35, Yeshua speaking, Watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at evening, the starting point, or at midnight, the second point, or at cock crowing, third point, or in the morning. So Mary was coming in the morning, last, no, the, the, the evening, the midnight, all those bits had already gone. The few times the Bible refers to the first day, stop thinking it is Sunday, i.e. in Acts chapter 20 verse 7, um, and 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2, John 20 verse 19, and so on. I said this is explained for more in detail in the book, Have I Got It Right, God? So I think John 20 verse 9, he says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. So here you see, evening start is the first day, but yet it is evening. Clearly the first day was in the evening. It is not Sunday evening, this was Saturday evening, biblically. Because if it was Sunday evening, that biblically would be the second day. Because the evening starts at sunset. So it was, if, if it was Sunday evening, that would have been a second day, biblically. Those who celebrate on our Sunday, assuming that is when he rose, have been deceived into honouring the sun, God, memorial, remember the host of heaven we spoke about before, than God, via Exodus chapters 20, verse 8, and Exodus chapters 31, verse 13, where God says, Verily my Sabbaths, his Sabbaths, not man's creation, you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you. So you can really identify what religion someone is by the day they worship. Muslims on Friday, Jews on the seventh day, Christians on a Sunday, Hindus on whatever day they do. Yeah? So that is why it's a sign. The day you go to your worship, your hold and reverence, is a sign of what faith you're following. As I said, see also Matthew chapters 25 to 28 um, comments. There's a link to that teaching below. Anyway, I hope I have stirred you to study to make yourself approved, rightly, not wrongly, dividing the word of truth. Remember, the law is truth. If you mix with ignorant people or deceived people, you may remain ignorant or be deceived. 
God said the Jews were to be a light to the natural Gentiles. Do not get deceived by Messiah's death to redeem the lost sheep of Israel and animal sacrifices for forgiveness of sins. That is a major deception method of Satan. In other words, people say, oh, so are we still to kill animals and all that kind of stuff? No. If you understand Leviticus, if you understand what Yeshua came to do properly, you'll see he came to um, still keep the system going, but replace the polluted animals that the Israelites used to offer with his unblemished blood. I say, if you, um, I should really give another, another link. That is a major deception of Satan for further study on what, on, I say, what Yeshua came to do. See a study called um, Leviticus 16 and Hebrews on YouTube channel, and I'll try and put the link below with the other links. So shalom, and below are the links for your further studies.